podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Welcome to the holiday edition of Smart People Podcast. I'm Chris Stemp. And I'm John Rojas. I wish I had some of those sleigh bells. I, I know. Just be like, bring, bring, bring. I know. What's funny is there's like nothing holiday about it. <laughs> I just felt like saying that because I'm in the holiday spirit. I yeah. Now, if you guys listened to the last episode and made it through the intro, you might know what we're doing here on this upcoming episode. We are basically giving you the second half of that interview. So we ended up talking to Dr. Stephen Cowan for, I think, over an hour and realized we should probably split this up into two. And it was it's incredible stuff. I mean, we really cover another array of topics here, but you can tell he knows what he's talking about. So real quick, as we mentioned last time, Dr. Cowan completed his pediatric training at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital Center. He is a longstanding member of the American Board of Pediatrics. He really focuses on children and incorporating Eastern and Western medicine. He specializes in things like ADD, ADHD, autism, Tourette's, things that are affecting us more and more these days and affecting our kids and our younger generation. So hope you enjoyed Dr. Stephen Cowan, and Roach has something he wants to tell you about. Before we get into the interview, head over to smartpeoplepodcast.com, click that Amazon banner at the top of the page. It's the easiest, most painless way that you can help support the show. Just click the banner True. at the top of the page, go to Amazon, buy some gifts for your friends, for your loved ones. Hell, you guys could even send us... No, don't send us anything. Just no. click the Amazon banner, support the show. We appreciate it. Have a awesome Thanksgiving. No, they'll, they'll have already had Thanksgiving at this point. Oh, well, have an awesome holiday. I think Hanukkah is overlapping with Thanksgiving this year, uh-huh. so... Enjoy that if that's your thing. Enjoy the upcoming Christmas season if that's your thing. And if none of that's your thing, just enjoy being with friends and family. It's always the kid's problem. Right. And actually, I think that that is luckily or, you know, it's something that people are starting to realize. I mean, there's a number of people you listen to a lot of TED Talks, so it's uh, Sir Ken Robinson or, yeah. uh, you know, Khan Academy, they're yeah. really trying to change that model and it's finally gaining traction. You know, it's exactly like that. And and the absurdity, the thing I tell parents is, look, it's a in, in child development, there are microclimates. We got to think contextually about development because when we take the kid out of, you know, just sort of examine the kid without his context, it's a really sad sad lab experiment and it leads to really bad stuff and it, it's a little bit like this where where are my where are you guys we are right outside of dc okay so imagine your climate is different than someone in arizona or even where i am in new york imagine me demanding that your tomato plants should have the same number of tomatoes on august 21st that i do that's absurd, right? Mm-hmm. But that's what we do in child development. You know, the the first grader should be reading this many, this level by this age because he's in this time, regardless of his microclimate. That's insane. That's unnatural. Do you see what I'm talking about? I do. And then you just, you know, I kind of go back to it's. It's also it hits home pretty good because my fiance is a kindergarten teacher, and in a, in one of the most difficult in terms of just prestige and expectations, uh, school districts in the country. And she comes home, she's really frustrated just because, you know, kids are all over the spectrum, right? Like you said, some kids reading at fourth grade level, some can't read at all. And it's tough to figure out how to navigate that water for one teacher in a classroom. And it's figuring out what that solution is. I mean, wh- what have you seen or read or heard that you think might help us in this regard? Well, that's the next frontier for me because my hat's off to your fiance because they are in a, like pediatricians, they're in a crunched position right now. They go into it for all the heroic, noble reasons that pediatricians go into this, right? 
And it's really heroic. She loves kids. She's dedicating herself, herself to that. And yet the curriculums are giving less and less wiggle room for creativity. And what do we use now as the marker, as the benchmark for readiness? One thing, age. We're not using anything else, but if you're five, you're ready for kindergarten. If you're six, you're ready for, you know, it's insane that age is the only marker. That's like the most radically reduced view of a human being, this complex <laughs> human being. You know, age is only one marker of growth, maturity, and development. And we're ignoring all the micro context. So, you know, the shorter answer to your question is I'm trying to really, this is sort of the frontier for me. I'm like Captain Kirk and we're moving into this, the final frontier, school is the final frontier to boldly go where no man has gone before. <laughs> because I'm telling you, it's a tricky place. And I, and my hat's off to her. I know the frustration and the stress teachers are under right now. They're, they're daunt, it's daunting because, you know, kids are coming from all different stress levels. Um, I'll give you the simplest stressor for a teacher right now. You ready? Yeah. Okay. This is a, this is a big problem. We've given birth to digital natives, <laughs> okay? And your fiance, <laughs> although she's probably really savvy with digital media, she's a digital immigrant. How old is she? She's 30. She was not born into it, yeah, okay? Yeah. 30 years ago, maybe her parents had uh, a computer, but mm -hmm. it didn't have what we have now. Yeah, no chance. <laughs> so I had a kid recently sitting on his mother's lap it right across from me mom had a magazine on her lap and he was trying to swipe it <laughs> okay that's a digital native okay he's adapted to this world right and it's really fast very visual very hands-on and he's navigating his way you go into an apple store and you watch the little kitty table and there are two-year-olds navigating the ipads <laughs> now sit them in an analog setting like a classroom and it's like they're going backwards what i call to call it in my book is the slow modem syndrome <laughs> it's the equivalent of you going back and using a 56k modem right now you'd go out of your mind oh yeah, just no, the thank you. thought of the sound of that dial up <laughs> haunts me sound watch it painting the uh. screen <laughs> When I got a 56K modem in 1995, it was the fastest on the block, and everybody came around to watch it <laughs> over the next five minutes, paint a screen. Oh, Do man. it now, and I guarantee if I videotaped you sitting at the screen, watching it, tapping your hand, pulling your hair out, looking to do something else, I'd say, oh, he's got ADD. That's genius. I, I can't, that's genius. That's the best. That is the best. Uh, analogy I have ever heard, ever, <laughs> hands down. But that's one of the dilemmas your fiance is dealing with. So they can't sit in the classroom anymore because they're used to a different way. And so there's a disconnect now, and we have to improve that. And and the danger is this. I'm not against technology. I think it's fantastic. Look at what we're doing right now. We're connecting. Yeah potentially to you know thousands of people oh yeah oh yeah and, and that's beautiful the downside is always creating balance in our lives so that on one side we understand that the screen opens worlds but we want to always counterbalance it with the qualities of feeling present within ourselves knowing how to shift into another kind of attention which is a an awareness of our body of awareness of others an awareness of um, a way of shifting away from what we, what turns us on to something that may seem slower or faster or confusing or less rewarding. And finding a balance between these and cultivating it because, let me tell you, the, the digital world is very sort of attractive. It turns on certain f positive reward centers just like cocaine does. Mm-hmm. And so we have to be able to create a balance. Now that we've moved into this world, I don't want to take it away. You'll never take it away anyway. So we have to find a way of creating 
balance in a classroom so that children learn how to be present within themselves and how, what it feels like to develop a vocabulary of feelings so that they know what it feels like when they're frustrated because the teacher is talking too slow or they what it feels like when they can't sit in a seat any longer. But creating a vocabulary, creating a way of developing a practice that allows them to move through these feelings. So that we're not shutting down feelings and saying, don't do that. Remember that I do a lot of work with emotions in children. And remember that in children, feelings overwhelm them very quickly. And they become behaviors like lightning. In a little two-year-old, it's kind of funny to see. They feel something and act on it really fast. There is no space between the feeling, the emotion, and the action. I wrote a chapter in a book recently on this called Healing Emotions in Children. And the quality is so fast that it's like lightning. And when you say to a little kid, don't do that, Johnny, what they hear is don't feel that. And that makes no sense. <laughs> How do you not feel it? <laughs> yeah. So there's no space between them, right? It's so lightning, it's like an impulse. I feel it, I act. A little baby feels pain, they cry immediately. You know, they're frustrated, they throw something. You know, it's like lightning. <laughs> to build space between the feeling and the emotion, the emoting into the world, what I call in my book, Fire Child, Water Child, the barking of the puppy, is the trick is developing a language for that, labeling it. It's estimated in neuroscience that it takes 200 milliseconds to find a name for a feeling. But when you do that practice, that's enough time to get a handle on it and shift its direction or shift its intensity or feel it and redirect it or understand it or categorize it or whatever. It's sort of like teaching a kid colors. How do you teach a little two-year-old the color blue? I've always wondered how you teach a kid anything. So, <laughs> I mean, no, but this one you know. You guys are both the sky. Very bright guys. How yeah. would you teach a little kid blue? The sky. You show them something blue and tell them blue. Yeah. Once. Over and over. Yes. So that's it. So you do know this. Yeah. So you got to show it to them. You say, hey, look, blue. That's blue, too. That's blue. That's blue. And you're waiting for the light to go on for them to go, oh, blue, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it takes repetition and it takes labeling it while you're experiencing it. You can't sit with a kid at two in the morning with the lights out and say, <laughs> okay, I'm going to teach you blue. So you know the sky is blue. You can't do that with a kid. You got to show it to them. So it's the calling it while it's happening again and again and again. And the same is true about frustration, happiness, sadness, anger, fear. Label it while it's happening until they get a dialogue going. They develop a vocabulary of the coloring of their feelings. And when they do this practice in kindergarten, you now have a true power because now they're building space where the feelings don't freak them out and they're not acting like wild puppies all over the place. Your fiancé loves you because you've now made her life a little easier yeah. because they're actually creating – it's sort of a connoisseurship. You know how you see these guys – you know, and they take wine and they're going, I taste a little oak from an ancient <laughs> hillside in northern California that must have had rain. You know, they go on and on and on, right? There's a scent of cow dung in the field. That's what we want, the connoisseurship of feelings in kids. What we call this, and there's a movement that you can, your, your listeners can look into called social emotional learning. That's a kind of empowerment. Go to the C-A-S-E-L dot com site. And there's a lot of resources for parents and your listeners to, to open their minds to this. Developing dialogue of how to play with your emotional life. 
so that you feel more in tune with what's happening around you. And when you're in tune, you pay attention better. And when you pay attention better, you feel empowered. And when you feel empowered, you get to use your secret powers for the good of all mankind. I was actually going to ask you a question right before that, and that might be the answer for this still. What can parents do, what can we do to kind of bridge this gap with the problem that we have in the school, in the education system? Like you said, they love technology and they're used to it, but there's no funding really to get all this technology to them. They're pulling back on like physical education and arts, whether it's music or actual art. What can we do to bridge those gaps? Because, it, I mean, it really does seem like we're being extremely detrimental to these kids by pulling all of these things away and then putting them in that mold of saying, okay, you're six, you should be here, you're seven, you should be here, and now it's a factory. Yeah, and, you know, I love the way you guys are, like, right in there, right on it, because you're, you're nailing the right questions. What can we do? Well, there are actually movements happening. And, you know, my website has some of them that you can look into. There's several really good uh, places for parents. But ultimately, I am a true believer that nothing is more powerful than the love of a parent for his child. They will, it's truly heroic, and they'll do anything for their kid. So when we reframe the problem the way you just did, and we say, how can, what can we do if the schools can't do it? I mean, ideally, I would love to change the schools, but that's not going to happen overnight. And not everybody can afford some of these alternative schools that are really expensive, you know, that may be out of the box enough to do some of this. But what we can do is in every waking second that we have, that we're not stressed out and doing all our work, we are the role models. What's the best? Let me ask you this. What's the most effective way that children learn? By doing. Yeah, even more than doing. By teaching? By playing. That's how little kids learn. And so you play with your kid. That doesn't mean you indulge your kid. That doesn't mean your kid's plugged into playing video games. That's not playing with your kid. Playing with your kid is sort of open-ended, I don't know yet, adventures. What, you, could, you don't need to be in a fancy gym to do that. You could do it in your backyard. You could do it in a park. You could do it in your living room. But it's that creative playfulness as a role model that opens you up to possibilities. And it's the really simple – it sounds too simple to be effective. Like you're looking for big – answers and i'm telling you that it's smaller than that it's humbler than that it's spending time playing you know where the best place to play with your kid is the dinner table why is that they like playing with their food well playing with your food is an experiment (laughs) first of all it's an exploration cooking with your kid is an exploration but you know where what eating together is really about do you know why we eat together Let me ask you guys this. Hold on. (laughs) Why do we eat? To nourish ourselves. Okay. So that's one answer. That's the utilitarian assembly line answer (laughs) for fuel. And you've bought into the gas station model of I got to fill up the tank. Yeah. It's not wrong. You're not wrong. But it's only one of five reasons. Give me some others. We like to. Okay. So what does that mean? Emotion. Good. So it's fun. It feels good. It satisfies us. And a little bit, it's entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. So there's an emotional eating that's very big in our culture right now. So that's a good one. And it's an effective one. I would say that's the fire reason. Wood reason is it's utilitarian. It keeps me going. Give me some others. Um, I don't know. That's it. You tapped me out. No, come on, guys. You're so smart. Think more. Uh, is this why we eat in general or why yeah, we eat with people? Why we eat. Simplest question you could ask. Because we've been taught to. Okay, good. So that's good. So there's a philosophy to it. And what does that mean? It's six o'clock. It's time to eat. Mm-hmm. Right. Or I don't eat meat. You know, there's some philosophy, there's a belief system. I only eat Chinese food or whatever. (laughs) Okay, so that's 
good. That's the metal reason. So there's a there's a basic belief system okay. involved with eating. Whether it's we always eat breakfast at such and such a time, or we always eat dinner here or whatever, right? So that's good. So now we have it's entertaining, it's fuel, and there's a belief system. There's two more. The body tells us to. Okay, so that has to do good. So you're doing great. That's listening to your body. Hunger, the power of hunger. You know, in poor cultures, that would have been the first one they would have answered, which <laughs> is that it's not just to fill up. It's just not because of fuel, but that my body tells me to, that I'm listening to my body carefully. And there are several researchers, Susan Johnson is one of them, who's done this amazing research that when you listen to your body, when you're able to tell when your body is half full, that improves your power of learning. It proves your power of attention and retention of material. Isn't that amazing? Wait a sec, wait a sec. Did you just say when you're half full? When you know, when you can feel when you're half full. Okay, I'm going to do an experiment with you two now. Both of you close your eyes and see if you can find your heartbeat without touching your chest. Now, this quality is called interoception, I-N-T-E-R-O-ception, like perception, C-E-P-T-C-I-O-N. Interoception is we have a nerve called the vagus nerve that feels your insides. It's 80% a sensory nerve. It's one of the biggest nerves in the body. And it has the ability, it's got a hand on your heart, a hand on your stomach, a hand on every organ in your body, actually. And it can sense the inside of your body. Turns out that when you work this sense, when you can feel it, the better you are at feeling it, the calmer you are the more focused you are, the more effective you are in digesting your food, learning information, which is kind of digesting information, and the healthier you are, the longer you live. So the experiment I asked you to do, this interoception, you, you, what the, the way it goes is, and everybody at home can do this, you try to find your heart. Some people can't even find it. Some people can but you can practice and get there if you're quiet enough and you feel your heartbeat and then try, you set a timer and see if you can or ask someone to tell you when, you know, six seconds is up and you count your, once you can find your heartbeat, you count your heartbeats and then you go back and measure your pulse in six seconds, multiply them both by 10 and you compare them. And the farther apart they are, the more out of touch with your body you are and the more work you have to do to get back in touch with your body. It's called the interoceptive quotient. Anorexics, for example, are terrible about with this. They can't find their body, literally. They can't find their heart. What was that called? In introspective? Interoception. I-N-T-E-R-O-C-E-P-T-I-O-N. And it's a very well-known phenomenon. It's not talked about much, uh, much. The same thing is true about feeling when you're half full. So, next, so when you go to dinner now, I want you guys to stop somewhere along the wolfing down your cheeseburgers. <laughs> stop yourself and say, wait, am I half full? I know when I'm empty and I know when I'm full. People should, I always do this at Thanksgiving. Okay, I want everybody to slow down and tell me when they think they're half full. So that they're not lying around watching the football game groaning. Mm -hmm. So, but there's power in it. Now, you got that, right? Yep. You, you, you're with me on this? Oh, yeah. Okay. We forgot the fifth reason for eating. We're not going to get this one. Boredom. No, no, no. That's, the, uh, that's the flip <laughs> side of entertainment. Um... Ready? I'll give you a hint because I like you too. <laughs> Think of a nursing mother and its baby. Baby is on that breast looking up at the mother. What do we call that? Nursing. Keep going. Come on, guys. Uh, <laughs> I know you're guys. Women I was just this. about to say, I'm like. Women would have this, you know, a second before I said it. Connection? Yeah, bonding. Oh, oh bonding. bonding. <laughs> <Okay>. Oops. <laughs> yeah, well, bonding. Like Neanderthals over here. That we. <laughs> and what's the best way to bond? through eating is storytelling and podcasting 
Yeah, well, that's storytelling. Most of the stuff that people are going to like from what we just did is the stories, Mm -hmm. not the facts. Absolutely. And that's what humans' greatest, greatest gift. It distinguishes us from all other species on the planet is our ability to tell stories that have a beginning and a middle and an end and a purpose and a point and a connection and a sharing. And it turns out that when you sit at the table bonding and everybody's telling stories, you slow down, you listen to your body, you connect, you digest better. It's more entertaining. You hit every one of those five reasons. That's amazing stuff simply for the fact that probably the fondest memories I have are, I don't know how old I am, but I can tell you the exact setting and it's sitting around the dinner table with my entire family and we would just get into these bizarre, deep, like conversations and all that stuff. Time, you know, ceases to exist and it is, I mean, it's, it's, it's where I probably put myself when I'm meditating or whatever it might be, calming down. It, it just, it just is. And you know what I call that? The first classroom. So we need to have more parents yeah. eat with their kids and spend time with each other. I can't believe we didn't get that one right away. <laughs> yeah, well, it's okay, guys. It's unbelievable. I feel you like don't have breasts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I, I know. You we're... have nipples, though, and I'm not quite sure why guys have nipples. <laughs> oh, that was going to be our next question. <laughs> <laughs> it has to do with prolactin and prolactin and oxytocin. And oxytocin is the bonding hormone. So we have it. We can make it. And storytelling is how we do it. And I guarantee if I did oxytocin levels on you guys, they'd be high because you're nice guys and you mean well and your fiancé is very lucky. I appreciate that. You can quote me on that. Oh, believe me, I will. (laughs) (laughs) I know know we've taken up so much of your time. I'm sorry we're, you know, taking your night. No, it's it's a pleasure. And, you know, we can do it again. Absolutely. I have to squeeze one quick thing, and you can make it a 30-second response. But the vagus nerve... I um a doctor once told me I passed out giving blood and he said yeah. you have vago vasal something That's right. Vasovagal syncope. That the- means you're a healer. I have I used to pass out also that way. Healers do that. V- the vagus nerve is the nerve that it it's the opposite of fight or flight, okay? It fight or flight is the sympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve is what really is the rest and digest flip side of it, the yin and yang of our lives is fight or flight and rest and digest. But there's an ancient aspect of the vagus nerve that fires up the reptilian part of it. When you feel cornered in situations that are kind of life threatening and you're not the kind of fight or flight guy that there's no no place to go, you've got a needle in your arm because you're getting blood drawn or you some you know whatever pain or whatever, and you dive to the bottom of the pond, you stop breathing, you fall down, you pass out, whatever what actually happens is the vagus fires up, and the blood vessels dilate, the heart slows down, and you you literally drop. It's a defensive mechanism, but it's particularly, I find, over the years, it's there in these weird big moments when you're like suddenly, shockingly there. And, you know, I don't pass out like I used to because I've drawn blood on so many people that it's like no big deal anymore. Yeah. But in those moments, it's sort of like the sudden presence you're suddenly fully there. Yeah. And it's too intense. Huh. And so um, now that you're meditating, you probably wouldn't pass out as much because you've had more practice in being present. But it's part of the vagus thing that I'm trying to stimulate by knowing when you're half full. What's the best way to stimulate the vagus nerve so that you're calm, that your fiancé can do in a kindergarten class? Belly breathing. That stimulates the vagus nerve. When you breathe with above the diaphragm, that stimulates the sympathetic fight or flight response. That you can't think straight then. Then you just got to get out of the classroom. Then you, you're getting – that's the road to Ritalin. You get them to belly breathe. You shift down. You literally down shift. And now you, you, you let go a little bit. And you relax a little bit. You ground a little bit. You center. 
Well, that's amazing. I really appreciate it. I've always kind of wondered, and I just let it go. And you're you know, just the healer, dude. <laughs> I lo- I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that line. That's that's my superpower. I'm taking there, it. <laughs> well, I have to say, we've interviewed over a hundred people. This is by far one of the most just overall enjoyable and enlightening conversations. I really, I mean, I I appreciate your time. And I want you to let us know, let our listeners know, where do you put your thoughts? You have your book, Fire Child, Water Child, which we'll put a link to. Okay. Um, yeah. Where and, else? Um, I have a Facebook page as well where I'm often I'll, – I'll tell people what I'm doing, what I'm thinking, where I'm teaching. I teach a lot around the country. Um, and I do several – uh, webcasts, you know, through the year, I'm going to be doing one with Entheos. Um, they have an interesting, um, sort of, uh, program developing for teaching as a module for classrooms online on the web, which is intriguing to me. So we'll see how that works this year. And, uh, you know, there's lots of venues for me. I'm writing articles and doing blogs, and I'm I'm working on several books now. So, you know, the Facebook is probably the best way, but, you know, there's all different ways that you can hear about me. And, yeah, I appreciate the support that you guys um, are are giving me, and I really appreciate your enthusiasm. You're both great, and keep up the good work. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. We'll we'll link to this stuff so people can find it very easily right on our website. The Mind Body Green article is fantastic. That's where I first came across you. So we'll be sure that people can find you and continue to follow what you do because it's great stuff. So again, thank you so much and uh, and and have a great night. Okay. Thanks both of you. Be well. All right. You thank too. you. You too. That was part two of our Dr. Cowan interview series. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you got as much out of it as Chris and I did. Just a fantastic interview talking to this. I mean, how often do you look at people that talk about like Western stuff and then or Eastern medicine and then go, okay, this is going to be weird? Well, I mean, the thing is, I like the idea of it. I mean, oh, I, sure. I really do. I think there's a lot of... The idea was great five, know. six hundred years ago, and then we got medicine, but... Well, no, but the way he talks about it, you know what I mean? No, absolutely. I'm just saying usually when we have conversations with people about Eastern medicine, it's just like they only want to do Eastern. Yeah. Yeah. And well, I liked what he said about, you know, we triage using Western medicine, but for the holistic approach, they've been doing it for much longer. Yeah, it's very cool. I mean, look, I'm all for a little, uh, you know, antibiotics or penicillin here and there. When you need it. Yeah. But I mean, you know, eat a little healthier, try and get some sleep, get some exercise. Oh, man. I need to do all three of those. I know. I just so I nabbed forever today, but we're just babbling. Hey, guys, if you can uh, go leave a review or hit us up on email, smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. Let us know what you think. Preferably leave a review because, that you know, that's nice. Yeah, and click our Amazon banner on the top of our page at smartpeoplepodcast.com. Easy way to support the show. Everybody's going to be doing some shopping now. So just why not click the banner? You know, one I, click. I, I wanted to say this. When you email us, let us know your, your thoughts. I mean, we're up to hear the good things, obviously. I love it when people start out and say, hey, I love your show. But, you know, if you have something you want, oh, didn't like this guest, don't like the, what you do here, et cetera, et cetera. We don't mind it. We're not going to dislike you. It's good stuff to hear. No, did you see somebody left a Facebook comment uh, saying that they're leaving a negative review even though that they really liked the episode? Yeah. That what was, was that funny. for? He was just being funny. He said, ah, I'm leaving a negative review because you said even if you want to leave a negative uh, one. And he's oh, like, I gotcha. Yeah. No, yeah. It was good stuff. So uh, we appreciate that. It makes our day when we see comments on Facebook and get emails, all that good stuff. I'm doing something weird with a microphone. All right. Th- I think that means the show's over. We will see you guys next week. Bye.